Good morning and welcome as we gather together on this Sunday and as we prepare our hearts and minds, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we are tired from fighting the good fight. We are exhausted from running the race. We are weary from keeping the faith. We need your care, O oh God. We need your quiet center to silence the tumult of our lives. We need your spirit to bless us with prophesy, to revive our dreams, to guide us with visions, nurture us with the reins of your love, that we may stay strong until the end, when we will be crowned with your righteousness. We lift up all of these things as we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our God is awesome and worthy of praise. In the Spirit of Christ, we dream dreams. In the Spirit of the Holy One, we see vision. In the Spirit of Truth, we prophesy. In Christ, we run the race. In the Spirit of God, we keep faith. Today's affirmation of faith is an affirmation from Romans chapter 8, verse 35, and verses 37 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors. Through the one who loved us, we are sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus our Lord, thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, as we gather together, let us take a few moments and to remember names and situations that we lift up with our joys and concerns. And we will have a brief moment of silent prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
As you follow along today, our reading comes from Job in chapter 2, verses 23 through 32. Be glad, O people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains in righteousness. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other Never again will my people be shamed. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There is much in life that is unpredictable. Our health, world affairs, the behavior of others, just to name three. These unpredictable things become important only because much of our life is predictable. Our routines at home and work. Other people are predictable. The relative who will talk your ear off. The friend who loves controversy, the co-worker who always has a smile. But what about God? Is God predictable? Is there a set pattern to God encounters with us? Do our encounters with God have a predictable effect on us? That is one of the issues the prophet Joel focuses on in today's reading. The prophecy that has his name is short, only three chapters. The three chapters focus on a single problem. There is a national crisis, a plague of locusts. Joel sees this plague as an onset of the day of the Lord, which is mentioned five times in the book. It is a familiar theme for the Hebrew prophets. The day of the Lord is a day when God will go to war with God's enemies. This event in the history of Israel is meant to be a warning to God's people, including us. We, too, have locusts in our lives that serve as wake-up calls, a tragedy, a failure, people who seek to harm us. The result of these locusts in our day is that our joy is withered away. Joel's words to believers of both his day and ours is simple. These locusts are pointing us to God. That doesn't mean, of course, that God has sent the locusts, although God may have. It does mean that God can use these events in our lives to draw us closer to God. If that is true, what should our response be to the locusts in our lives? Some people fight back when they feel attacked. Others work harder in their personal or spiritual lives. Some become depressed 
and shut down. And still others play the blame game and try to find someone responsible for the difficulties they are facing. Faithful people wisely turn to God. When a person does this, they can expect criticism. Family and friends may suggest that it is being a hypocrite to turn to God in a time of personal crisis. Why didn't you turn to God in the good times, they ask. God never suggests this in Scripture. God encourages us to turn to God in our times of crisis. Joel says that God can and will do something about the locusts. God waits on us to place our faith in God. Then God acts on our behalf. Joel contends that God always responds when God's people repent. God responds by putting things right. The Lord protects us from our enemies. God comes to provide for our basic needs. God comes to comfort us in our sorrow and despair. If this is the way God responds to the negative events in our lives, how should we respond to God's intervention? Some people might go back into spiritual laziness. Some people might take God's intervention for granted. Joel envisions a day when the people of Israel respond as they should. They will respond to God's intervention by living in a new way. This new way of living is the life of the Spirit. Joel contends that when we respond to God in faith, God will pour out God's Spirit on us. Regardless of our age, our gender, our status, this is a new idea. In the Old Testament, God's Spirit is poured out on individuals, prophets, kings, leaders. The Spirit resides in a person as long as they are doing God's will. Once their task is finished, the Spirit leaves them. Joe envisions a day when the Spirit is poured out on all God's people and remains with them. The result of this gift from God is that wonderful and unexpected things will be seen. Everyone will testify to God's goodness. Men will testify as we might expect in an ancient cultural setting. But surprisingly, women and children will also testify. This is a sign of a new world. Of course, Christians understand that new world to be the kingdom of God. Christians understand this new world to have begun at Pentecost, when followers of Jesus received the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. These disciples went out into the streets of Jerusalem and witnessed to what they had seen and heard. Peter's sermon at Pentecost is the summary of what these first Christians were telling their Jerusalem neighbors. It is a reaffirmation of Joel's message. Repent and turn to God. Experience God's blessings. Receive the Holy Spirit. Enter the kingdom of God. Peter makes clear that this has all been made possible through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus who he claims is the promised Messiah. Joel's little book presents us with a timeline. It is a timeline for Israel, but it is also a timeline for our own lives. Each of us must decide where we are on that timeline. Are we living with the locusts? This is the initial stage where a person realizes that there is a problem and that they will need help. Are we turning to God? Have we come to the conclusion that God can and will help and that we need to ask for God's help? This is the second stage. Have we turned to God and as a result enjoy God's blessing? This is where many Christians are today. People have turned to God and God has responded and they are enjoying their blessed status. 
Or are we living in the Spirit? This is where God wants us to be. If we are living in the Spirit, we are telling others about what God has done and wants to do. We are sharing what God has done for us and encouraging others to join us in this wonderful new life in the Spirit. Amen. Thank you for joining us today, and as we get ready to go out and begin a new week, let us go to God in prayer. Today, brothers and sisters, let us go out to fight the good fight. Let us finish the race. Let us keep the faith, for God is the hope of our salv salvation. Let us place our trust in the one who crowns us with righteousness, and to God be the glory, for God is the hope of us all. Amen.